This evening, uh, we're continuing to look at Psalm 119, which gives to us uh, many reasons why we ought to appreciate the law of God and why we ought to seek to know it and to follow it. Uh, This evening, we're going to look particularly at how it is the way that we can become pure, like our Lord Jesus Christ, morally pure. What I'd like to do is go ahead and just read this particular section, and then we'll um, see what the Lord has for us here. Psalm 119, beginning in verse 9. The psalmist writes, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your words. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word I have treasured in my heart, that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have told of all the ordinances of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways. I shall delight in your statutes. I shall not forget your word. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing again this evening. Now, we read in um, Acts chapter 11, verse 26, that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And why was it that they were called Christians? Well, it's because they were like Christ. The people saw Jesus Christ in them. They realized they were following Him. And why is it that they were doing this? Well, it's because of the Spirit's work in them, certainly. It's because He was working in them to make them want to be like Him. And they actually wanted to, to the point where they were trying to be like Him. They were seeking to follow His example. Now, Paul tells us that when God chose us, that He also predestined us to become more like His Son, Jesus Christ, so that Jesus uh, would be the firstborn among many brethren, by which He means, of course, that Jesus would have the preeminence, that He would be first among many who were just like Him. That's exactly why the Lord gave us His Holy Spirit, is so that we would want to be like His Son. But it's also why He gives us the command to be like Him, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and to make no provision for the flesh. In other words, to follow Him and to seek to be like Him, to have a pure mind and a pure heart like our Lord Jesus Christ had and has. Now, John tells us in our meditation that this is what the hope of being with the Lord one day will actually produce in us, that we would purify ourselves as He is pure, which means that there is something that we must do. Now, sanctification, we were talking about sanctification in the new members class uh, today. Sanctification is that which follows justification. If we've truly trusted Jesus, If we are truly justified in His sight, if we have been declared not guilty and basically are now uh, ready or equipped or qualified by Jesus Christ to enter into heaven, sanctification will follow. The putting on of Jesus Christ, the purifying of our souls from the corruption that is in this world, that's in our own hearts uh, because of the way we came into the world so that we would be separate from the people of the world and not like them, but like the Son of God, that that is something that would take place. We need to realize that that's not something that happens automatically, but it's something the Lord tells us that we need to be involved in. It's something that we must work at. Now, how can we do that? Well, that's exactly what the law of God was given for us or given to us to do. That's what the psalmist tells us this evening. Now, first of all, he asks the question, how can a young man, one who is inexperienced in the things of the Lord, 
uh, who is particularly liable to sin against God because he doesn't yet know the ways of righteousness, how can such a one keep his way pure? Well, the answer is by keeping it according to God's Word. The key to moral purity, the key to being like Jesus, to think the way that Jesus thought, to do what the Lord Jesus Christ would do, to becoming more of what God predestined you to become, is living according to God's commandments. And that's really what I would like to focus on this evening. Now, again, remember that Psalm 119 in its entirety is meant to instill within us a greater appreciation uh, for the law of God. We saw in the first section uh, that if we keep it, we will be blessed. And that's certainly something that I think all of us as believers want to be. But the second section tells us how we might be pure, how we might be more like Jesus Christ, how we might actually fulfill, as it were, that uh, desire that the hope that we will one day be with the Lord should instill within us how we might be like Him. We're going to look at five things this evening that will help us, I think, better understand how we are to do this, how we might become more like Jesus. First, we'll look at the kind of effort that you must be willing to put out to become like Him. Secondly, how you should value that knowledge that will lead you to purity. Uh, thirdly, how you can treasure that knowledge more. Fourth, the best way to hold on to that knowledge. And then fifthly, how to make better use or perhaps the best use of this knowledge. So first of all, what kind of effort do you need to be willing to put out to become morally pure if you're actually going to succeed? Well, the psalmist tells you in verse 10, he says, with all my heart, I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. If you are to grow in moral purity, this is something you must really desire to do. You can't have a divided heart. You really can't if you're going to grow in the Lord. You can't be torn between the flesh and the spirit. You can't be torn between the world and God. These two are opposed to one another, and they are constantly at war with one another. And whenever you give in to the flesh, you do necessarily lose something of the Spirit's influence, and you lose something of your ability to gain this moral purity. Satan is in control of the world in which we live currently. The kingdom of heaven has been planted here. The kingdom of heaven is growing. It has been stronger in the past. It happens to be weaker today. But for the most part, even though God is sovereignly in control of all things, what we see going on in the world is under the control of the prince of this world, which means the world is geared by your enemy to entice your flesh to draw you away from God. And so first, if you if you are going to grow in moral purity, you have to determine that you are going to seek Him. You are going to seek His strength. You're going to seek His truth with all your heart. And you need to pray that God would help you, that He would help you stick to the path that He shows you. As the psalmist also prayed, do not let me wander from your commandments. Whatever else happens to me in this world, Lord, do not let me stray. Do not let me leave the path of moral purity. Keep me from compromise. Keep me from the world. Keep me from sin. Help me to obey. You have to have a whole heart that is seeking moral purity. Secondly, as you purpose to live this way and seek the Lord for His strength, as you seek the Lord for His truth so that you can be moral, morally pure, uh, what kind of value do you need to place on the truth that the Lord actually reveals to you, the truth that is going to help you achieve moral purity? Well, the Lord tells us, or the psalmist tells us, well, the Lord tells us to the psalmist that you need to treasure it. He writes in verse 11, your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. 
He says that you need to rejoice in it when you discover what it is. He says in verse 14, I have rejoiced in the way of your testimony as much as in all riches. And he says you need to delight in it. In verse 16, I shall delight in your statutes. In other words, you need to see it for what it really is, and that is precious. And why is it precious? Well, again, because it shows you how to steer clear of sin and how to grow in moral purity. It shows you how to honor the Lord, how to obey Him, how to really uh, follow the Holy Spirit as He seeks to lead you in the ways of the Lord so that you will not offend Him, you will not quench His work, you will not uh, grieve Him. And it's important that we don't. Because the Holy Spirit is the one given to us by God to change us and to move us in this direction of moral purity. His holy influence in your life is what makes you want to become more like Jesus Christ. And when you resist Him, you're actually going off course. You're actually going into those directions that will weaken you. And when you succeed in doing that, you offend Him. And when you offend him, he withdraws from you somewhat and leaves you basically to fend for yourself more. And of course, if he does, you're going to have a more difficult time seeking to become more like Jesus Christ. Now again, if you have an undivided heart that desires to be like him, if you seek him for his truth, if you love that truth, delight in it, rejoice in it, and treasure it, you'll be much less likely to go off course. And you will follow Him as, as He seeks to lead you in the truth, and so you will be spiritually strong, and you will grow in moral purity. Now, thirdly, how can you desire the truth that He gives to you even more strongly so that you will treasure it in your heart. And I think this is an important point in verse 12. You will by loving God more, whose truth, of course, it is. He says in verse 12, blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. Now, this idea of, of ascribing to the Lord blessedness means that you see within Him value. You love Him and you treasure Him. And I think you understand that the more you love God, the more you're going to want to please God. And so the more you will seek to know how it is that you might please Him. In other words, the more you will seek to know His law or His commandments. Whenever we resent or hate someone, the last thing we really want to do is listen to them. The last thing we want to do is submit to them. Our resentment colors everything about them so that they can't do anything right in our eyes. They can't say anything right. That's why it's important for us to maintain love and respect for those who are in authority, whether in our family spheres or in the sphere of the church or in the sphere of the state. Really, whether they make good decisions or bad decisions, the Lord still calls us to love and respect. And that, of course, is also why it's important that we pray for them so that they will make good decisions, they will make godly decisions, and especially those decisions that will allow us to do what the Lord actually calls us to do. Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 4, First of all, then, I urge that in treaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. I think Paul means by that, of course, that God desires even the kings and all in authority to be saved. But if we pray that the Lord will restrain them as well and grant that we may do the work the Lord has called us to do, that will also open the door for us to bring the gospel to others that they may be saved. We need to pray for them. And we need to desire that they would do what is right and we need to desire their salvation. We need to make sure that we don't become embittered against them. 
because, again, it will make it difficult for us to do what the Lord has called us to do on their behalf and on behalf of Him. But what's true of them is especially true of God. The more we love Him, the more we can bless Him and praise Him for His truth, the more we're going to want to listen to what He has to say, the more we will respect what He says and purify ourselves from everything that dishonors Him. So do you want to treasure God's law more so that you can become more like the Son? Then you need to love God more. And let me just suggest to you the means of grace are the ways by which you can gain more of the Spirit so you might love Him more so that you will treasure His law more. So the Lord tells us that we need to seek Him with our whole hearts and we need to treasure His law in our hearts and we need to love God so that we might treasure His law more. But fourthly, what is uh, perhaps the best way to hold on to the knowledge that God gives to us besides loving Him more? Well, teachers know that the way that you can actually hold on to knowledge and truth more is by giving it away, by teaching others what you know. Notice what he says in verse 13, with my lips I have told of all the ordinances of your mouth. That's really uh, the best way to hold on to anything in, in this world is really to give it away. It seems kind of like a contrary principle, doesn't it? But we know that it's true. The best, thing, the best way to hold on to the things that God has given to you in this world is basically to give them to Him and to use them for His glory, to use Him to advance to His kingdom. Uh, that's how you store up treasures in heaven. You realize that the only thing that you can carry out of this world are the things you give to the Lord in this world. Everything else goes to, to others who stay behind. Again, we've, we've heard that analogy many times. You've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul behind it. There's really no reason for that because you can't take it with you except the things you give to the Lord in this life, those are the things you will take with you. Jesus tells us, don't store up your treasures on earth where thieves can steal and where these things can be corrupted and, and dissolved, but rather store up your treasures in heaven where no one can take them, no one can steal them, and they will never corrupt. Well, again, the way we do that is by using what we have for the glory of God. Now, how can you hold on to the truth that the Lord teaches you? Well, it's by sharing it with others, by giving it away. The more you communicate it, the more you will actually hold on to it, the more you will reinforce it in your own mind and in your own life. You know, it's, it's uh, I think teachers have understood this, that sometimes they learn more from their teaching than their students who are listening to them. As you seek to give it away, as you seek to communicate it to other people, you understand it more clearly. And let's not forget as well that your actions certainly speak more loudly than your words. If you're going to give this truth away and help other people to learn God's ways so that they might be pure as well, you need to make sure you're living a life that's consistent. You need to make sure you're applying it to your own life before you seek to help them apply it to their own. Otherwise, you're going to undermine what it is you're saying with your words by your life. You need to make sure you're living by that truth before you give it away, but give it away. Communicate it to others. You'll benefit from it as well as them. And then finally, how can you make better use of this treasure? How can you make the best use of the treasure that the Lord entrusts to you as you seek Him for it? Well, three things. Memorize it, meditate on it, and do it or observe it. First of all, he says, memorize it. Verse 16, I shall not forget your word. Make sure that you hold on to what the Lord actually shows you. I mean, why is it that you read your Bible in the first place? Isn't it that you might know God, that you might honor Him, that you might love Him more, that you might know His ways so that you can do it? But what if you study the Bible and you, you learn things from the Bible, but then you don't really take the, the time to hold on to what you've learned? 
and you lose it. It goes out of your mind. How is it going to benefit you if you forget it? You need to memorize the word, I shall not forget your word. Secondly, you need to meditate on it. He says in verse 15, I will meditate on your precepts. I think meditation is perhaps one of the best ways to memorize something. As a matter of fact, it might even be superior to it because you do more than just, you know, learn the bare words and, and parrot them, but you actually understand them. You know what they mean. Uh, meditation is focusing on what the Lord actually says in His Word, seeking to understand it more thoroughly. It's been likened to the, you know, the, the, the chewing of the cud, you might say, the cow you know how the cow has a series of stomachs and he guzzles a bunch of food down, but he has the ability to regurgitate it and, and continue to chew it until he's extracted from it all the, the nutrients, all the nourishment that is there. Well, that's what meditation is like. You, keep, you, you, you take it in, you memorize it, but you keep bringing it back to your mind and you keep mulling it over or chewing it until you get all that there is out of it. And then having memorized it and having meditated on it thoroughly so that you understand it, you need to apply it. Verse 15, I will regard your ways. Understanding, again, what the Lord wants you to do, apply it. Apply what you have learned. I mean, what is it that you're doing in your life that the Word of God tells you that you need to stop doing, that you need to repent of? Repent of those things. What is it that you're not doing that you need to begin doing? You see, knowledge is really useless unless you apply it. As a matter of fact, it can actually be worse than useless, can actually be dangerous if we don't apply what we know because if we know the right thing to do it and we don't do it, then we're more blamable than those who didn't know what they were supposed to do. Jesus gives that parable of two servants, uh, one who knew his master's will and the other one who didn't, and yet both of them did things worthy of a flogging. Jesus says they'll both be flogged, but the one who knew his master's will will receive many lashes, but the one who didn't know it and still did deeds worthy of a flogging will receive few. The more we know, the more culpable we are, the more blamable we are if we don't do it. But on the other hand, if you know and you apply, the more blessed you're going to be because the more you're going to be like your Lord, the purer you're going to be morally, the more you're going to do for His glory. And that is our goal. Know God's Word and memorize it, meditate on it, but do it. It doesn't do you any good unless you do it. And so as Joshua said to God's people when it was coming toward the end of his life, he says, you know, if Baal is God, serve him. But if the Lord is God, then serve him. And if you've already come to a firm conviction that God is the true God, that his son is Jesus Christ, he is the only way of salvation, and he wills you to be pure and holy, then seek that. Serve Him. And if you're going to serve Him, understand what it is that He wants from you. That's what it means to be a servant. He is the Lord, and you are the one who, again, the S word, submits. You submit to Him. What is it that God wants from you? He wants you to serve Him with your whole heart. He doesn't want you to be divided between Him and anything else and not, especially not this world. He wants you to bless Him and to treasure Him and His Word, His law. He wants you to be willing to share that Word, especially the gospel, with others. But again, the law is a part of the gospel in the sense that it shows us how we are to show our thankfulness to the Lord for His mercies toward us. And He wants you to memorize His Word. He wants you to meditate on His Word. He wants you to do His Word, to observe it. He wants you to do what the, the Christians did in Antioch when the people saw them and said, oh, you must be Christians because you're like Jesus Christ. He wants you to live up to that name, Christian. 
the more you do what the, the law of God tells you to do, and the more successful you are in breaking free from the influences of this world and purifying yourself and becoming more like His Son. The more the Lord's going to use you, the more He's going to bless you, the greater your reward is going to be in this world, and that is really what the Christian life is all about. That is why He saved you, that you might become like Him. That's why He laid down His life for you, so that you would lay down your life for Him, that you might become more like Him and do His work and will in this world. Well, may the Lord give us the grace we need to purify ourselves as He is pure. May He give us the grace to remember what we've heard and actually to put this into practice. It's really quite simple. We do need to overcome our flesh and our desire for this world in order to seek these things. So let's pray that God would give to us an undivided heart. And let's remember that as we approach the table in just a few moments, that as the Lord has shown us that that is what He wills for us, we need to be willing to have such a heart if we're going to come to the table. So let's pray that He would grant it to us. Let's pray.